Good evening, and we'd like to welcome you to the fourth webinar of the season hosted by the African American History Museum. Tonight, we will be learning about the first Black firehouse here in Springfield. I'm Jamie Stout, a volunteer board member for the museum. I want to thank all of you for joining us tonight, especially our members and volunteers, and we welcome everyone from the community as well. If you'd like to know more about becoming a member of the African American History Museum, you can visit our website, spiahm.org. Now on to tonight's lineup. Our moderator tonight is Katherine Harris. I would be hard pressed to find someone in the community who doesn't already know her, but just in case, I'll tell you a little bit more about her. She has been most, she was most recently named Springfield's first citizen. Catherine is an educator, librarian, and historical interpreter. Catherine retired from the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Museum as its library services director in 2015 after starting in 1990. And she worked with the Illinois State Historical Library before that. In her retirement years, she volunteers for more, more nonprofits than I have fingers to count. So thank you, Catherine, for moderating. And we're absolutely honored to be joined by Ken Page. Ken retired from the state of Illinois after 38 years of employment. He spent the last 25 years in, as the director of the Office of Environmental Justice at the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. He attended undergraduate school at the University of Alabama. Selma, Alabama is his hometown. After graduating, he moved to Springfield and attended Sangamon State University, which is now UIS. Ken is the past president of the Springfield branch of the NAACP. He was president during the 100th anniversary of the 1908 Springfield race riots. That was the catalyst in the formation of the NAACP. He is currently the president of the Springfield chapter of the Illinois American Civil Liberties Union and so much more. We welcome you, Ken. Thank and you. as always, we will entertain questions from the audience all night. So uh, we will get to as many of them as possible. So please go ahead and type those in the Q&A box below. And so without any further ado, please help me welcome Catherine and Ken. Thank you, Thank you so much, uh, Jamie. We are truly pleased to be here tonight. And I am uh, certainly excited to, to be here and to talk to Ken about the history of the a co quote, colored firehouse, which is right across the street from where I live. So Ken. Yes, Catherine. Why don't you just start by telling us a little bit about the history of the firehouse. One thing that I know is that it was the firehouse that was, I don't know if allowed is the word or not, that, um, took care of the fires that were burning as a result of the 1908 race riot. So what can you tell us about the firehouse and the folks who worked there? Well, you know, the firehouse was built in 1901, 1902. It was built specifically for Black firefighters, because of segregation. You know, once upon a time, it, Black firefighters, they were referred to as the Negro firefighters, colored firefighters. And, uh, you know, Springfield was segregated at one time. I think people probably will, will, will challenge that, that whether or not it's still segregated. But they built this firehouse for those Black firefighters. And right. that the location is 1310 East Adams. That's, that's where it was placed, and it's still at 1310 East Adams. Now, it's not, it, it's, it's not inhabited by the Black firefighters anymore, but the building is still there. So those firefighters were part of this building, uh, engine number five, house number five. Oh, engine number five. Okay, so currently, engine number five is on 18th Street. Martin well, you know, I, well, what they did is that they moved the Black Firehouse, they built a new one at uh, Clay and M it's M.L. King now. Right. A.T. M.L. King. They built the new 
Black Firehouse at, at ML King and Clay. And that was in the late 50s, like 1957, 58, that they, that building was built. And they moved the firefighters from 1310 East Adams to M.O. King and Clay. At that time, it was 18th and Clay. Um, I have um, I have understood that uh, the firehouse across the street from my house was where the black firefighters firefighters were assigned, and that if white firefighters had quote acted out whatever that might mean at that time they were sent there kind of like as punishment as like a uh, well i'm not sure how you would phrase it but that is 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 that is, is that truly true well you know that <laughs> it's rumored that that did in fact happen and is written there are several places that is written that for punishment at the black at the white firefighters, they were sent there for punishment. But, you know, what people have to realize is that those black firefighters were some of the best in the city. Absolutely. They, they, I, they, they received I, great accolades. I, I said that, they, that they got commendations and accolades and all of that for the work that they did. And they, they were one of the, one of the best um, firefighting units in Springfield. Oh, exactly. So it wasn't that, you know, I'm sure that those those other firefighters that were sent there probably learned a lot, you know, from <laughs> them and probably was to their advantage uh, to go there and work with them. And they were great firemen. And, and this picture that, that you see now on the screen, it, it, it's, it came from the Sigma Valley collection. Mm -hmm. And I think it was in the uh, newspaper at that time, like circa 1926 or 27, that this picture was taken of the building do, and, and the do, firefighters in front of the building. Do, do you know who those firefighters are? Well, personally, I do not. I, I have information written about uh, with their names. Mm -hmm. And it's Lawrence Brandon, John Foreman, Harry Neal, John Allen, Henry Alexander, and John Farmer. Now, of course, I, there were two more than what's on there, but those were the firefighters in that, in that, uh, that, that firehouse. Did they have the same complement of firefighters that were at, quote, the white fire stations, or do you know? Well, I, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to say I do not know. I, you know, history tells us that when things were segregated, uh, most places that, that, were, that were built or left for, for Black people got secondhand things. So I'm not exactly <laughs> sure whether or not that happened at the firehouse. So, but whatever they received, they made the best of it. And Absolutely. ended up being some of the best firefighters in the city. So I understand, I believe, that the firefighters at this particular firehouse were responsible for fires east of 11th Street, which is kind of currently now, and perhaps even then, quote, the dividing line for black versus white. Now, I've just heard that, but I don't know if that's true or not. Well, you know, I'm not exactly sure whether or not that's true. I've heard that as well. And uh, they wanted to keep them away from, they wanted to keep them segregated. Mm -hmm. but, but we have to remember that west of 11th Street at one time, there were a lot of black businesses and things there as well. Yes, indeed, there were. <laughs> So you have where well, you have Horace Mann and all those things in that area. You have the, the and it goes where you have the uh, Presidential Library and Museum and all those locations. So those were black businesses and things there. So it is safe to assume that if anything happened, that those firefighters probably at one time or the other responded to those fires. Especially if we look at the uh, 1908. Absolutely. Insurrection in the city of Springfield. I know they, they, refer, to, they refer to it as a race riot, but uh, that's where white citizens burn the homes and of, of black citizens and the businesses of black citizens, as well Absolutely. as lynch black citizens. So that insurrection that happened in 1908, it right. is safe to assume that those firefighters probably 
you know, they were fighting. They were just like having a fight in Goliath, trying to put out those fires. There were fires west of 11th Street as well as east of 11th Street. So, you know, I'm not exactly sure, you know, how successful they were. We, we, we already know that they were not very successful in doing it. Hmm. Um, the, the, uh, the folks who are pictured, did you indicate who they were or do you know who these folks are pictured on well, the image? Well, do actually I read, names of six, I read the names of six of them. Actually, we have a brochure. Okay. The, uh, I, I'll just tell you about the building because I, I don't know the firefighters in, in this picture, they have the names listed. Okay. So, but they are in the picture, the names that I just read off. But I do know that there are several firefighters, their families are still in existence. In, oh, in really? Place. That's the Senor family, as okay. well as the Lockhart family. Charles Lockhart, Lockhart Sr. And, mm -hmm. her, and, and, and Mrs. Senor and, and Mr. Lockhart were firefighters uh, at one time. So their families still exist in the city of Springfield. And I'm not exactly sure the lineage. We haven't looked at that, but we're more focused on the building and, 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 uh, saving the building and uh, making sure that that part of uh, Springfield's history is not lost. Now, Absolutely. I would like to say that current day, that building still stands. Mm -hmm. uh, the Prince Hall Masons of Central Lodge number three owns the building and uh, we meet in the building and it's part of our Masonic, it's part of our, it's our Masonic Lodge upstairs. And you can see the three windows, that's the upstairs of the firehouse and, and, and uh, downstairs is allowed to, uh, to rent. So we, we do own the building, the Masons do own the building. And uh, we're very happy that we've done, that we were able to, we purchased the building in 1970. The Prince Hall <laughs> Masons purchased that building, the first black firehouse in 1970. So we did extensive renovations on the building. We added an addition to the back of the building and, and in 2000, we did additional uh, extensive repairs to the building because it needed it. New HVAC, new roof. We had an enge engineered uh, roof put on the building. The building sloped, so it had one of those engineered roof put on there, uh, rubber uh, uh, vinyl roof put on that building, rubber. And so a lot of things, a lot of rehab went on in that building that the, that the Masons did in that building. And that building, to secure that building so that it would not be lost forever. And I think that that is uh, an important part of Springfield history, uh, that it was in, that the building was indeed saved by uh, the Masons and the history is not, is not lost. Uh, you, you mentioned a brochure that you guys have done or that you you that you you have done that focus on that focuses on three significant um, buildings in the African American community in Springfield, including the firehouse. I do recall, since I live right across the street from it, um, an event that was held there to to uh, to draw attention to the building and that Ameren had some interest in assisting in the facade. Is that correct? And what is the status of, of, of that uh, activity? Well, you know, before I get to that, I would like to say that this, is, this building is an, an historical building in the city of Springfield. Absolutely. And it's, it's extremely important in the city of Springfield. And uh, so, you know, we endeavored to save it. The, the Masons endeavored to save it, which we have saved it. And so part of our plan was to, we, want, we, we were working to restore the facade right. on the building. So to look like it, it is in this picture. Now we take out the vines that's on the building and, <laughs> and I'll show some pictures of how it looks and things now and the, thing, the work that we've done to it. And we, we, we endeavored, we would like to restore the facade. I so think it looked that like the original first black firehouse. So as part, part of that, the, the Masons, we established a foundation. So the foundation, uh, centralized number three's foundation, uh, put together the brochure that listed the oh, three excellent. black historic sites, African-American sites 
in Springfield. So right. east of 11th Street. And it includes the Black Firehouse, Lincoln's Colored Home, and uh, the Judge the, Taylor House. Right, so Judge those, those Taylor's buildings. Judge, the, the Judge Taylor home, uh, folks might not know that much about it, but it also served as the Ambidexter Institute, uh, which was um, kind of modeled after Tuskegee Institute in Tuskegee, Alabama. And uh, it was a, I'm not, I, I guess you would call it a, a trade school. Mm -hmm. Uh, for uh, African Americans at that particular time in in our history, but uh, one one thing that I am truly uh, it, uh, uh, excited about is if indeed, or no, I'm not going to say if I'm going to say when the facade might be uh, returned as to like like it was in in the past the the very top of this image that you have is certainly remarkable. It is truly beautiful. And I would hope that uh, that might be part of the part of the restoration for lack of a better term, uh, that, that you guys might be able to do because it is truly beautiful. It is truly beautiful. Um, over time, how many folks made up a compliment for the folks who worked at uh, Firehouse uh, no, Number Five? You know, I want, I want, I, I'll get to that question. I'm not sure, but I want to go back to the, the issue of, of of the facade, and and you okay. mentioned that earlier, and I want to get to that. I, I don't want to leave Good. that out because in in in, in 2000, when the Masons we started that that whole rehabilitation of the building, doing extensive work on the building. And we, you know, in the 70s, I think in the 60s and in the 70s, people defaced a lot of buildings and put siding on them. So right. all of the, all of the uh, uh, work that you see on, on this building, the, the copper work and, and all of the freeze work and everything had, was removed and, and the surface was made flat. And so that you could put and I'm gonna put another picture up there so that you could put siding on it. And actually when they put the siding on the building in the seventies, when the Mason took it up, Masons bought it, that actually saved a lot of the work front of the building. So, mm -hmm. so what we, when we were, we were working to save the building and we, we, we thought it would be great if we could restore the facade on the building. So- Absolutely. So, so what happened is that we, we reached out to different entities. Amarin was one. Mm -hmm. uh, Hanson, for, we reached out to Hanson for their services because they provided the structural engineering services. And, and we, uh, as part of that endeavor for an architectural A&E study that, we, that right. was done on the building to see whether or not a facade could go, how, how to put a facade back on the building and whether or not the building was stable enough to hold the facade. So that's why Hanson came in and provided structural engineering services. And, and Bruce Ferry was hired as part of that process. We hired Bruce Ferry as our architect to design the facade for the building. And he did that. And, and we had different entities like Ameren and all uh, provided uh, funding so that we could do the A&E study and, and hire the architect. And so we, we've, done, we've done a lot of work, preliminary work, to, to, to make this, this building work, make the facade work and, and, and make it uh, look representative of how the building did look at, at one time. So, you know, we're, we're just hopeful that, you know, the cost of it, you know, as part of that a &E study, the cost was very, well, it was about $350,000, $400,000 to put the My facade goodness. on the building because they have to recreate everything on there. They have to re recreate and rebuild everything that was on that building. All the copper work and everything, the freeze wow. work and everything has to be done, recreated and put on that building again. And so, you know, that was, and, and we're still hopeful that that can be done. Now we've, we've been working extensively with different entities, the legislature, 
and all in the city of Springfield discussing that issue of uh, putting that facade back on the building. If, if, if is there a uh, 501c3 uh, organization to which the John Q. Public could donate to help the Masons return the building to its original um, appearance? You know, I mentioned that earlier. Yes, the Masons do have, the Prince Hall Masons at Central Lodge number three do have right. a 501c3. And it's called the uh, the Central Three Community First Project Inc. And, oh. and, and we needed a 501c3 in order to get donations from different from corporations and things like right. that because they said they when they when we went to them at, at the at the beginning they said that they prefer to their foundation would prefer to give donations to another foundation. So in order for us to get donations from large corporations, we had to have a foundation in place. And, and we will provide that information to people regarding the uh, Central Three Community First Project. And uh, it's all part of the uh, Central Lodge number three, and it's out of 1310 East Adams Street. So and does, does the, it, is there a website that folks could visit uh, to donate? Well, I'm not gonna, I, I, we will put that in, in the chat for people to do that, Catherine. All right then. That's good. Yes. That's that. That's good. Thank and, you. And um, boy, I think I think we do have uh, questions in the chat. Insofar as the history of the building is concerned, are there other things that you would like to share with our audience tonight? Oh, definitely. I have I have a, a ton of things I would like to you share with the audience. You have a whole bunch. <laughs> I do. Actually, no. I do. I, no, I prepared do. myself for this. It's been All right, going on so for a number of years have, since since 2000, but uh, you know, I would like to share how some important history facts, historical facts about the Prince Hall Masons in, in the city of Springfield. You know, we're, we're one of the oldest continuously uh, serving uh, fraternal organizations in African-American organizations, period, in the city of Springfield. And uh, I would like to say that we know that William, uh, Mr. Dunnigan uh -huh. was lynched during the 1908 race ride. And Mr. Donegan, and that's written in the history books. A lot of people did not know that. So that was revealed during the 100th year commemoration of the 1908 race ride. Mr. Donegan was a Prince Hall Mason. He was right. a member of Central Lodge number three. Right. And uh, so, and, and this whole thing has come full circle because the Masons purchased the building that, that housed the black firefighters that were part, that, that, that worked to put out the fires that were set by white citizens. Do you have a do 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 you have an image of the cornerstone? Uh, no, that's, no, I do not. Okay, be, well, I know that there is one because since I live right across the street, I, I I've seen it, and it does uh, recognize the original construction of the building, and also recognizes uh, the Prince Hall Masons Central well, Lodge. Actually, what it does it. <laughs> It was moved to that building in 1970. Okay. So it was relocated. It was say on the cornerstone. And you know, and I mentioned earlier, once upon a time we were colored. So it it <laughs> it, it, it it says on that building relocated on that cornerstone, the, that cornerstone from the building right. where we were before that we when we relocated in 1970. And mm -hmm. uh it, it has on there uh colored masons. So right. you know, once upon a time we were colored, and that's once part of our history. So, and that is very visible to anyone that would like to see that, you right. know, that, you know, because once upon a time, we were a lot of things in America. And uh, so we've come a, we've kind of, we've come a great ways with people uh, determining who we were a, as a racial group. But uh, right. uh, Mr. Donegan was lynched. Mr. Donegan was the junior warden. Those, that's, that's a title in, in, in masonry and, and as a Freemason in Central Lodge number three. And, you know, he was part of the, uh, centralized number three and uh, that it was unfortunate what happened to him and the Masons came full circle to purchase the building. And so in his memory, as well as the memory of all people, you know, we've done a lot of work. We've done a lot to uh, preserve that building. But I would like to say that we've, we've dealt with three administrations, the Davlin administration, the uh, 
we're currently dealing with the Lane Felder administration mm -hmm. uh, regarding the, the uh, helping restore the facade and things that's needed for that building. Because, you know, it's a big old building, not O-L, O-L-D. It's a big <laughs> old building. Right. And when you, have a, when you have a building that big and that old, you know, the operation and maintenance of a building like that is, is it, it can be very expensive, you know, to keep it, keep it going and doing repairs on it that need to be repaired and, and those different things like that, doing things that need to be done. But Council, not, I, I just want to mention, you know, we went to the Masons, we went to the different, the local uh, Springfield Historical Society and uh, Historic Sites Commission. We, all, we went to the State Historical Society and uh, regarding the building. And everyone was excited about the building because I think what happened is a lot of people either, we, we made sure that people realized that building was still there. Right. And we realized that that building was there, period. And, and the importance of that building and, and, the, and the purpose that that building served because there were a lot of cities and towns did not have black firehouses. You know, right. They didn't have black firefighters at all. So, and so everyone was excited about that building. So, you know, we discussed landmark in the building and mm -hmm. that landmark status. But, but you know, what, what came out of those discussions, especially at, those, especially at the state level, is that because we've done some additions onto the building, the Masons did additions onto the building, and it was everyone was in agreement that with the plans and, 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 the, and the drawings that we have of the facade, once we got to put the facade on the building, that we would that it would be great and appropriate to landmark the facade. So we're looking forward to that. And then we'll, for that facade to be on that building and, and that to be landmarked. So, so is it is, is that that with LPCI Landmarks Preservation Council of Illinois is is that what you're referencing about landmarking? Well, you know, it was the uh, it, it was at the it was at the state level, so you know, okay. it, could, it could be. So okay. that was back in in the middle of, in two thousand and nine, two thousand and ten, so eleven, twelve about four or five years at that time span that we were there. And so, you know, we, we're, we're hopeful that we can get the facade put on the building, but, but, but in the meantime, we, we, we are still doing renovations to the building. We, we uh, some of the flooring on the first floor needed to be replaced and, and we've done that. So we were able to secure some small grants to do different things on the building. So there's works that still needs to be done on the building to make sure that it continues to be stable. And we're working to put a parking lot, to have a parking lot put around the building. Because the building that will now, be excellent. The, the, the Masons on, is three lots. So the building sit on one, on one lot in the center and there's a lot mm -hmm. next on, on the east side of the building as well. That's, right. that's, so it's three lots. Now I would like to say that, that that area at one time that was doing urban renewal. So the, the uh, the city of Springfield wanted to purchase that building from, from the Masons and, hmm. and tear it down and put homes there. And, <laughs> and I'm very happy that at that time, because I wasn't living in Springfield, I was a kid then in Alabama, but at that time. In, in Selma? In Selma, Alabama, <laughs> correct. Very, very, you are very correct and love Selma, Alabama. But, but the Masons at that time had the foresight to say, we're not selling the building. Excellent. And they did not sell the building because had they sold the building, right. there would have been homes there. And right. that building would have been gone forever. Ab absolutely. And I would just like folks to know that you had been at one time, I think it's called the Worshipful Master. Is is that right? Well, you know, in, in lay terms, and, it's, and, it's, and, it's, and, a, it's a person I that's think, over the lodge. And I think that it's, I, I, I think that you are due a lot of accolades for the work that you did and others, you know, to preserve the building because indeed much as you have said, it could have been gone because my living right across the street uh, from the building, the place, the, my address was one of those places that was wiped out because of urban renewal. 
and someone provided to me a photograph of, of what was on my lot where I live. Um, so it is good that the Masons were able to save the building because who knows what might have happened. I mean, it certainly probably would have been demolished. It, 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 it probably would have been. And, uh, you know, I don't deserve any accolades. I, I think me and my brothers, my Prince Hall Masonic brothers, we, the building is, is our accolade and, and uh, you know, we will accept that. And, and uh, preserving that building is extremely important to us. It's our, it's our, Masonic, it's our Masonic temple, but uh, we, we, what we've learned is how the people in the city responded when we brought that, that whole issue with the his, history of the building to the forefront and how people in the community uh, said that we're very happy that, that you guys are there. And, and I'm showing you an image and, and hopefully everyone can see it. It says take part in history, help restore Springfield Historic Firehouse. And you can see there are different images. One, one in the, uh, the this lower the right uh, top corner, but it's probably mm -hmm. in your left. I don't know how you're looking at this, but it may be in your, the right top hand corner of, of this. That's the image of the building when we took the uh, side and off the building. And uh, you can see where they had, I, I say defaced the building. They took everything off the building to make it flat so they could put the side and on it. And you can see in the center, this is the, the, the rendering from Bruce Ferry, the architect that's working with, working with us, Drew, so that to bring that building back, to add that facade to that building. And at the bottom, at, at the bottom right and, and, and the uh, left bottom, uh, bottom part of the picture, you will see those are just images of the firehouse at different uh, points in time. But I want to share that, that uh, so that people could see that and see how, you know, the things, what we've gone through. Now, I, I was trying to pull up a current picture of the way it looks now. It's, it looks very nice. We've had <laughs> recently some, some members to go out and put a planter in front of the building. We have and that we have that is wonderful, and uh, because I live right across the street, I noticed uh, just John Q. Public walking by, and you have an informational sign in front of it, and I think that that allows people to uh, to learn about the history of of that building of the building, and I notice, you know, people stop. And, and, and read about it. And I can, I kind of, I can imagine their, their faces saying, mm, I didn't know that about this. So I think that the informational sign and that was placed uh, from whom? The informational sign. Well, well, the, the, the Prince Hall Masons put it out that we secured a, oh, a, a okay. small grant from okay. the Sangamon County Historical Society to That's do that, what I to thought, do that but I wasn't for sure. And uh, and so we were able to secure that small grant from through them, and we were very happy to to put that informational sign out there in front of the building because we it's extremely important. You're exactly right. People now say so what the building's at 1310 East Adams. Uh, people go by there, they stop and they read the sign, or people walk past it and read the sign, mm -hmm. and you know say, hey, I never knew this and. Absolutely. And, and it's a beautiful, it's a, a, uh, a sign company did the sign. And it's a very nice sign. It has a, not a ton of information, it's, but enough information it, so that you would get an idea of what the building was. And still right, it's, it, it, it's, quite, it's quite informative. And my living across the street, I notice people, you know, when, when they stop and, and I can imagine their faces, oh, I didn't know that. So, you know, the, the, the sign is, is a good thing. So folks know the history of our community and our role in the history of Springfield. Yes. And, and I would like to share that COVID changed, COVID-19 changed a lot of things for a lot of people. Yeah. Still, it still has. And in 2020, we were planning to do a reception at the first Black Firehouse. And and at that reception, we were from that reception, we were gonna do a walk and a driving tour from, from the first black firehouse to the Lincoln's Colored Home to the Judge Taylor home. And right. uh, so and discuss those. That's why we put together that brochure. The foundation put together that brochure 
on those three locations and, and the history of those locations. So, you, you know, we're, we're hopeful that later, later Maybe spring, we can do summer, that in 2021, this summer. Well, you know, it, it it's easier said than done. I, we don't want to, I, I, you know, once people are comfortable doing things and, and coming out, you know, we right. can do the walking tours. We can, we can, uh, we can do a reception outside. And uh, so now that people are getting fully vaccinated, I'm sure everyone on this uh, webinar, they are fully vaccinated. And uh, <laughs> so that they, they will, we will put that information out and people will be able to come by and we will give them a history of all three of the buildings and then we will visit all three of the buildings and uh, people are still excited about that. So we were ready to do that and, and we, we, we had a brochure prepared and COVID came and, uh, and I'll say that saving lives of humans in America was far more important than us doing a walking tour of the three Absolutely. Pittsburgh sites in Springfield. So it's still on our radar. So we're hopeful that late spring, early, sometime summer, we'll be able to do that and uh, at least some resemblance of that and get people out so that they can take part in that and, and look at those buildings and, and see how important they are. And, and I know you mentioned providing donations. Donations are extremely important. Important. We, we know the facade is, is extremely expensive, but, but I mentioned ma making sure that the building still stands. It's extremely important as well. You know, you look at Lincoln's Colored Home and the Judge Taylor Home, there's a lot of money that goes into keeping those buildings standing. Absolutely. Prior to you uh, doing full renovations on them. So, right. But I want to share that. And we appreciate you, sh we appreciate you sh sharing that. We, we have uh, comments and, and questions from from our audience tonight. And if I'm smart enough to do this, uh, I'm working on it. Um, one question says, can the community pick up a brochure and do a self tour? Well, I would say yes and yes. But the yes. self tour is just yes. going by the building. Your self tour is gonna to be going past the building, but we have brochures we, we provided brochures to the African-American History Museum and, and, and that's a good place to pick up the brochures. And, uh, and that would give you an opportunity to in fact, visit the African-American History Museum and, and, and I, see the great and things that they have there as well. I, as a board member of the African-American History Museum appreciate that plug. So thank you very much for that, Ken. Ken I, I appreciate you giving us a plug. Um, I think that you may have mentioned it, but I'm not sure, but we have a question that says, when did the firehouse open? 1901, it was like between 1901 and probably 1902, 1901, okay. 1902, that they mm -hmm. built and then moved in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. And uh, uh, Teresa Haley, who's with the uh, NAACP, as we all know, what, what, what do you think we could do to bring national, national attention to the firehouse? What kind of ideas might we have, um, you know, to bring national attention? I, it's particularly well, in quote, well, the North, I, I, you know, to have an African-American, a black firehouse, that might've been kind of a unique situation or, or, or was it? Well, do you know? the, the, well, the question you asked that, that Teresa, Ter Teresa Haley asked, which is a very important question, how do we bring national attention? And I think that's, that's, that's extremely important. We have shared this at the state level and uh, we, we need to push it more with Senator Durbin, Senator Duckworth. Uh, what about our, uh, local, our our no, local representatives. No, our, our congressman. Right. And uh, Rodney Davis. Rodney, actually, Rodney Davis has been in the building. Oh, he really? toured the building. Yes, you know, we actually, we, we, we haven't missed many steps. Uh, it's just, it, we, money just don't fall out of the sky. But we, we have contacted people and shared with them. Rodney Davis has physically been in the building. And uh, we just need, and actually, I will be contacting people like Teresa in the future because I, you know, and, and other people in the city that, that, is, that strongly uh, will, will strongly work with us 
to, to get that national attention. But it, you know, that's how we can push that with, with our national elected officials. And it's already at the state level. And so with all of them, our state rep, our state senator, they all have been in the building. So, you know, we, the, the facade was written in the first, well, it wasn't written in the first, it was written in the construction bill and Governor Rauner came into office and he killed the construction bill. And right. we, were, we, we cried big t crocodile tears. <laughs> and <laughs> so, so, you know, we've done a lot of things. So, so we are hopeful that, and, and that, and it is back at the state level now, we're having that discussion again. How do we get this done? And with uh, now we have Senator Turner, Doris Turner, and Representative right. Sue Share. So okay. I, if something is going to happen. It's just going to take time. We're going to have to be tenacious, and right. we have been tenacious. And uh, so, and and we don't let up. You know, we just keep, we just keep pushing at it, and 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 different, different at diff when there are different opportunities that present themselves. We, you know, we take it, we look into that and, and, and it should be, uh, you know, once everything is done, I, I think that Springfield is, it should be important to the city of Springfield now, regardless of what we've done to it, you know, Absolutely. And, and the city of Springfield should really want to save things. And, and I think, and, and it, it was part of, at one time, the African-American History Museum's walking tour. I know when they were right. downtown, it was part of the walking tour. They added it to right. that walking tour. And right. I know that uh, there have been bike rides passing and everything, organized bike rides and everything, mm -hmm. past that, as well as the Lincoln's Color Home, as well as the uh, Judge Taylor House. So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get to be part of that once now that everything is opening back up, so that we can get all those people there and and, and get those other people that that can that can make waves for us, good waves, good and good, good trees for us, and shake those shake those trees for us, and right. uh, to get those things done. But I do appreciate those questions. Uh, has the building been officially registered and historically landmarked? And we I mentioned I mentioned that earlier. Abs no, okay. I mentioned that. I know there have been efforts well, made for that to happen, but well, no, it wasn't. We didn't. There were. No, we did not make efforts for. We discussed it. Okay. Because actually, we don't want people coming to our building. Yeah, we, we, we went to them and discussed what we had. We put on the table what we had. And to landmark a building, that may, that would put us in a position where we could do very little with that building. Absolutely. And, and Absolutely. so, you know, the experts said, which was very important, said, since you, you have this facade, you've done an a and &E architectural engineering study on this facade, you got all this, this work from the architect and everything, these plans put together. When that is done, let's landmark the facade. Because if you try to landmark that building now, you're not gonna be able to do anything to that building unless you go through people. And so we went to these historic uh, sites and these different entities because we were looking for money. We were right. not just looking for them to tell us, we'll put a sign in a book to say this is a historic. We were looking for some money to save the building. Correct. They said, well, we don't have any money to help you save the building. We can just slap a landmark on it and then let you find the money. And then, you know, and so we said, well, you know, you need to work with us better. So we, we'll try to save the building, figure out we can save it, but we'll landmark the facade. So that's where mm -hmm. we are with landmarking, the facade on the building, once it's put on the building. I have a, 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 a question here from one of the folks uh, who, who would like to know, has there been any consideration given to secure a, a, a fire truck from the era to place somewhere on the property? Now that would really be cool. That would, that would be, cool. be cool. Yeah, I, I, it would be cool, but I, I think that uh, we probably, well, well, you know, once we, once they do the facade, the facade has, the doors on it are not gonna be working doors, but we, we do have a room in the front of the building. Right. That it has the original seal in there. It has the place, you can see the doors are still there where the fireman's pole came out. The poles are no longer there. And so, you know, there, there's an opportunity. We have looked at, you know, there are different things that we have looked at, you know, talking to families about once we're going to, we call it our museum, once we mm -hmm. get everything in place and uh, talking to families about maybe loaning us some of the uniforms and, memor uh, and things, different paraphernalia that the firefighters wore. And, and I would like to, at, at, at uh, one of the past 
police chiefs in Springfield, a police chief, fire chief fire in the city chief. of Springfield, uh, Ken Buston was the fire chief at the time we were doing the renovations on the building. We had oh, in the really? building. And he, Mr. And Ken came down there and physically worked with us with hammer and nail on the building. And this wow. was, he was a fire chief. And that was extremely important to us. But he shared with us, and I haven't gone down to firehouse number one, but he said he went to, somebody went to an auction. And they, 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 he has, he purchased, they purchased the log book that had the names of the firefighters in it from, from, from the black. Really? So yes, so it is, it is down at firehouse number one. I haven't gone there yet, but I, 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 I just figured once we get that building done, that facade on there, we're just going to go and they're just going to loan it to us and put it on. <laughs> <laughs> we're just Absolutely. going to say, just loan it to us. And just loan it, it we to think it, We think it would be very appropriate in that building. But, the, but Ken Fushton, he was the fire chief at that time. He shared that with us. He came down there and helped us put up drywall and stuff like wow. that. And he was excited about it. And we have some other tips about different firefighting associations and things like that, that once we get things rolling, that they, will, they probably will be able to help us. Great, great. Uh, let me see what other kind of questions we might have. Um, hmm, wow. Hmm. I'm looking at questions. Um, at that time, even if a black owned business was in their jurisdiction, would a white firehouse have responded to a fire also? Hmm. Well, you know, I wasn't a firefighter then. I would assume, you know, it was only one firehouse. So it logic would tell us that they would, they probably did. You know, I, I don't think that one firehouse could fight them all, all the fires, but I'm sure. Probably not, right. I will, Probably so, not, and, so, and they may have responded. I'm not sure their response time. And, and how, how many firehouses. firehouses were in Springfield at the time of the firehouse across the street from me? I, I, did, I did not understand your question. I did okay. not hear your question. Oh. How many fire stations were there at the time of the existence of Firehouse Number Five? Well, I'll share with you. I will tell you this, and, and everybody's going to think, "Oh, that, it was a genius for thinking of that." We had at least four. Oh, <laughs> you are so smart, Ken Page. No, I, and that's You're a good question. I know we had at least four because that was Number Five. So absolutely. you know, at least I'll say there was at least four more. Absolutely. It could have been six, seven, eight, could have been 10, but I know we had, in addition to number five, we had at least four more. At least four more, duh. <laughs> that, good answer, good answer. And actually that's, that's some information that we would have eventually get once we start putting everything together. You know, right. uh, the, city, the city has that information. And, and, right. And, and engine house number five has a lot more information down there with them in their I'm sure. archives as well, yes. Uh, the, the the image that you showed at the start of the presentation, what was the date of it? Or did well, you... I mentioned to you that I don't remember. It was circa, I'm gonna to try to share it again, 1926. 1926. Okay. 1927. And this image came from the Sangamon Valley collection. And, uh -huh. and, and and the firefighters in the front are the same ones that we have a picture of circa 1926. So and uh, do you do are, are, are there any uh, descendants family members of any of those folks who who uh, who served at um, firehouse number five that still might be in Springfield? I, I mentioned earlier the uh, Charles Lockhart family. Oh, okay. The Clarence Senor family. Right. Okay. The Senors and the Lockhart's. Very good. And actually, Mr. Lockhart's uh, grandson, Kenneth Lockhart, is on the board over at the uh, Route. Route 66, History. the uh, 66 History. Is that what yes. it's called? Route 66 History. With, right. Uh, with, with that group, Gina Lathan and all, he's on that. And, and uh, so 
And then this firehouse is part of, on, part of their exhibit that they have on their wall as well. Oh, wow. Very good. Very good. Uh, what other wonderful things do you want to share with us? Well, I, I would like to say that uh, we, we do appreciate everyone's interest in, in this. And uh, we will be able to provide you with more of an opportunity to participate, however you would like to, you know, to contribute. You know, we will do that. I, I think it's important that, that we save buildings. Absolutely. Significance in the city. And, uh, and we have and three- Our history as well. We have as three as African-American as sites. To the history of Springfield. Right, we have three African-American sites in the city of Springfield that should be saved. Uh -huh. And that's the first black firehouse or the colored firehouse or Negro firehouse, however you want to phrase that. However you want to call and, it. And right. Lincoln's colored home. And they're all within <laughs> walking distance of each other. Absolutely. So, you they know, they the, are. In the Judge Taylor house. I had those are, and we, and, and please visit the African American History Museum. And if they run out of brochures, we will provide more to them. And, Very good. Uh, we, and, uh, and it also, the brochures will give you information on the, uh, on the other two sites. On the other two sites, as well as the, uh, the foundation, 501c3, where Absolutely. donations will be made to. Uh, I see that Jamie has reappeared. So. Well, hey, thank Jamie. you both so much for this information. I enjoyed the discussion a lot. And I know by the number of questions that have come in through the audience, we weren't able to get to all of them tonight. But I will encourage people to reach out to us. Um, we can get your question to Ken and maybe he could get you some more an answers on some of those as well. Um, I know I learned a lot. I know the audience is invigorated to really learn more about this history. And like you guys said, it is just so important to keep this history alive and thriving here in Springfield and across the nation. These are the types of stories that we don't often hear about. And we, as um, the African American History Museum and um, your foundation there can really want to make a difference in that um, through these webinars and through different collaborations as well. So um, again, thank you for that. Um, we do want to encourage everyone to keep an eye out on our Facebook page and website for future webinars and educational opportunities. Um, we want to encourage you to come by the museum as well. Come by the, the museum. And we are open Thursday through Saturday from noon to four. As always, the museum is free and it's open to anyone. Right now we have a brand new exhibit on the 1908 race riots like that was mentioned here earlier tonight. And um, we couldn't be even more excited. We have a new exhibit opening in September, September 4th to be exact. We've just started advertising a little bit, but it's the Negro Leagues baseball exhibit um, in collaboration with the museum from Kansas City. So we're super excited about that. You will see a lot of promotion about that coming up um, and a lot of buzz. So we're hoping that um, everybody will be vaccinated and ready to come out um, anytime, but the baseball exhibit we're super excited about. So stay tuned for more information coming about that. And we're definitely going to have a webinar on that topic as well. Um, and as we close out the webinar tonight, you will get a short survey that pops up. Please take it. It helps us to improve our um, offerings and it also tells us what you want to hear in the future. This topic tonight came from a survey. So um, after one of our last webinars, I reached out to Kim and Ken and he was like, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so that's how tonight's came about. So we really want your suggestions on how we can make this um, history continue and to tell these stories to help Springfield and the nation, like I said. And always we want to thank our members and our volunteers out there in the audience. You really truly are the backbone of our organization and we truly say thank you. So Catherine and Ken, I thank you so much on behalf of the board of directors of the African American History Museum. We thank you guys for taking the time and we thank everybody out there for joining us tonight. Thanks guys. Thank you. We'll see Good. you next time. Good night. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, Jamie. Bye.